Yeah. Well, hello. I, my name's Michelle Thompson, uh, one of the co-chairs along with Paul Steinberg for this particular sub-working group. We would like to welcome you and thank you for your contribution today for your presentation. Sure. Uh, so while people are still uh, showing up, filtering into our meeting today, then I'll I'll give a brief introduction of who you are and then um, invite you to to give a uh, overview, uh, introduction of your presentation, and then it'll be turned over to you uh, to take over the floor. So everyone, welcome. This is Alam Tab Tabasi, is that correct pronunciation? Alham Tabasi, yes, very good, thank you. Thank you. She, she is the Chief of Staff for Information Technology Laboratory uh, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Uh, we usually refer to this as NIST. And this is one of six research laboratories within NIST. It supports the mission to promote US innovation and industrial competitiveness by advancing things like measurement science and standards and technology in ways that enhance economic security and improve our quality of life. ITL conducts fundamental and applied research in computer science and engineering and mathematics and statistics. All of this is done to cultivate trust in information technology and metrology by developing and disseminating standards measurements and testing for interoperability, security, usability, and reliability of information systems. All of these things are, are, are the sorts of stuff that we care deeply about here. And um, just to point out some of the publications, um, it looks like open source work is of a focus, uh, such as the NIST fingerprint image quality uh, software. This links image quality uh, to optical uh, fingerprints to operational uh, needs, and that is a huge deal. So uh, plenty of amazing work that you have done. So I invite you to take the stage and to describe what you are going to talk about today and then to commence. Thank you for that uh, kind introduction. Thank you for invitation to be here. I want to take a second and acknowledge my old friend, classmate, uh, it's good to see you here at this singer name here had no idea that uh, I will run into you. Uh, it happens sometimes. I, I had a gave a talk to the Department of Transportation and a similar thing happened. So uh, what a small word. Um, okay, uh, you guys asked me to come here and talk about some of the work that we are doing on trustworthy, responsible AI. I uh, understand that uh, you um, you're using, uh, you know, your uh, uh, most focus on application of the AI machine learning for uh, some of these advanced communications work that you're doing. And so I'm going to uh, focus the work, uh, the talk on the work that we're doing. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, I am hoping that this will be more discussion, question and answering. Uh, and so feel free to stop me and ask questions whenever you want to. Um, yeah, Alan, yeah, thank you for that. And just a little bit more context for you, if it, if it helps. Um, the FCC asked us to study artificial intelligence and machine learning, as, as you said, as it applies, applies to communications in the future, I'm being very general. And mm -hmm. one of the things that obviously came to rise was safe use, um, and, you know, responsible use of artificial intelligence in that context. Mm -hmm. and, your risk management framework came to the forefront. And one of the recommendations that I think we're very solidly thinking about is suggesting that the FCC leverage the RMF uh, mm -hmm. to assess mm -hmm. and maybe even send playbooks to uh, ecosystem mm -hmm. partners. Uh, so yeah, looking at the frame, looking yeah. at what you're doing as a, as a foundation for some of that work. Uh, uh, that, that's great. And I, I do have a slide on the profile and we can talk more about this awesome. too. Uh, wonderful. So, um, uh, and again, as I said, uh, please stop me and ask uh, uh, the questions whenever you want. Uh, so, um, many of you know NIST, but uh, let me just say a few words about NIST, NIST uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology. It's an agency under Department of Commerce uh, as the uh, federal laboratory with the sole mission of uh, helping uh, US industrial competitiveness. Uh, uh, we uh, the bulk of our work is to cultivate trust in technologies. We do that by advancing measurement standards with uh, advancing standards and measurement science for uh, technologies to make them more uh, secure, reliable, uh, uh, accurate, uh, uh, valid, uh, in other words, more trustworthy. Uh, and that's exactly what we are doing in the space of AI. Uh, like many of you on the call would know that AI is not new to any of us, uh, many of us, you know, uh, uh, my first project at NIST when I joined in 99 was development of an open vocabulary speaker recognition. 
And since then, I have been involved in various computer vision and machine learning program. I just said that to say that AI is not new to uh, any of us, but with the advent of the uh, deep learning and all of the advances of AI and AI being discussed everywhere, uh, we built this uh, trustworthy responsible program at, uh, at NEST. Uh, back in 2018 that I am leading that program. Uh, so this is what we are doing in the space of AI. Uh, the um, box on the top left is uh, conduct foundational research to advance trustworthy AI technologies. This is really understanding uh, limits and capabilities of the technology. A lot of talk about trustworthy AI uh, in the past few years, uh, several high level a value-based document from OECD AI recommendation to executive orders that came out of uh, administration here in the US. Talk about uh, uh, AI technologies based on uh, shared democratic values. And I think the opportunity for us, the tech community to, is to get those uh, high level principles, value-based st statements and translate them into technical requirements that can be used by designer developer, deployer, evaluator of AI systems. And that's the bulk of the work that we are doing here, Information Technology Laboratory and AI RMF being uh, one um, main component of that, that I will talk a lot more about that. But I just wanna also give a couple of minutes uh, attention to other things that are going on. As I uh, mentioned, this has a very broad portfolio of research from building the most uh, accurate atomic clock to uh, robots in smart manufacturing to research in advanced uh, communications. Uh, uh, our researchers across NIST are using AI as a tool for their uh, uh, scientific work, uh, for the scientific discoveries that they do every day in the laboratories. Uh, it helps us as we are working on those foundational questions about AI and trustworthiness because we have some use cases to relate to. Um, I, uh, evaluations is a uh, is a really important part of the work that we do uh, in many areas of the work, but particularly also for uh, for AI, uh, bringing the whole community on uh, shared understanding of what to measure and how to measure device and device of metrics, development of the methodologies, characteristics for the test data. Uh, we have decades of experience on evaluations of the biometrics, face recognition, fingerprint recognition, um, natural language processing, uh, and we are uh, uh, building on top of those to do evaluations of trustworthy AI. Um, standard is our middle name, uh, but we are not standard development organizations the way ISA or uh, IEEE's are. Uh, in fact, as you know, there are very, really good policies in the US that um, instruct uh, standard development as a bottom-up approach, industry-led, and the job of us, Fed's uh, public uh, sector, is to uh, support uh, private sector in their participation. And we do that by providing quantitative data for development of clear, uh, scientifically valid, technically sound standard. Uh, we can do that because we are always considered as the convener, objective, uh, you know, third party neutral participant that can, through the evaluations and through the technical work, really bring uh, the right uh, contributions to the table uh, for the discussions. Uh, NIST is a non-regulatory agency and that uh, non-regulatory nature of our, uh, of our existence is extremely important to the type of the work that we do. And uh, frankly, uh, uh, allows us to team up with the whole community, including the industry, uh, and uh, work with them. And uh, the, the trust that industry has in us uh, and helping us in uh, many of the mandates that we get from the uh, uh, Congress or executive uh, uh, branch is uh, essential and maybe even the secret sauce for allowing us to do the things that we do. And like many of you here, we also have the workforce, you know, building capability and capacity uh, challenge to make sure that A, we have the resources, both in terms of the compute and uh, uh, personnel, uh, the talents to do the research and how to uh, retain them. We have, uh, I several times mentioned some of the uh, mandates that we have, I'm not going to spend a lot of time here, but just saying that AI risk development of the AI risk management was a congressional mandate. We were happily working in that area as it is really our object, you know, within our scope and mission. Uh, Congress agreed and 
and uh, gives us a time a tight timeline to develop the risk management. Uh, we uh, uh, the establishment of the National AI Advisory Committee, NIAC. Uh, it is a, a presidential uh, advisory committee. They they they, they will uh, advise president and the um, National Initiative Office, which is housed in the uh, uh, OSTP at the White House, uh, with. Uh, uh, AI matters, and uh, the legislation is very uh, kind of broad, uh, uh, identifies 13 different things from the state of AI science to workforce, to international engagement, to um, to the work of the um, uh, structure of the National AI Initiative Office within uh, White House. Uh, a establishment of that was tasked to the Secretary of Commerce and Secretary of Commerce has tasked us to uh, with the support and administration of the National AI Advisory Committee. Uh, many of you probably have heard about the National AI Research Resource Task Force. That's a, a 12 body that are uh, uh, at, uh, the legislations at uh, NDA FI21 um, ask uh, this uh, for establishment of a uh, National Research Resource uh, Center for the whole US. And the idea is to provide uh, equitable access to data and compute uh, to everybody in the US that wants to do the uh, AI research so that uh, the, um, the cutting edge uh, AI research is not only available to few. There are four uh, person from academia, four person from industry, and four person from government. And I'm one of those four person from government sitting on the National AI uh, Research Resource Ta Task Force. The interim report came out, I think, in February, March, and we're working on the uh, implementation plan. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna skip some of these things about the standards and coordination that we do to get into the um, to uh, development of the. AI risk management framework. Uh, so a couple of uh, uh, level setting, uh, what it is, it's a, again, a congressionally mandated to develop AI risk management. Uh, I keep saying congressionally mandated because among us friends, uh, I, if, as, if it was just, um, we wanted to do this, we wouldn't call it a risk management, we would call it a trustworthy framework. And I will talk about it why. Um, and we would give ourselves a bit more time rather than just two years to do this. It is for voluntary use, and that's really important, again, aligned with the uh, uh, non-regulatory nature of our, uh, uh, of our agency. I get this question a lot that if it is voluntary, then what's the enforcement mechanism? Well, for a voluntary thing, you really don't have an enforcement mechanism, but by design, we are hoping that AI RMF is not gonna be a checklist. Uh, rather, uh, uh, we are hoping that the use and implementation of the AI RMF would be because of the value that it provides uh, for a uh, uh, cultivating a culture of understanding risk and managing risk, uh, uh, again, voluntary. Everybody has, you know, every organization, every entity, every agency has a set of core principles and, and uh, you want to uh, see those core principles reflected in the type of the service or product that they provide. And so we are hoping that the risk management becomes a dialogue at every level of the uh, life cycle of the AI. And I'll talk a little bit about this. It takes a pro-innovations and rights-preserving approach. Uh, what do we mean by that? Uh, in terms of the pro-innovations, we don't want to anything to be prescriptive. Everything is outcome-based focus and uh, tries to provide guidance on the things that you want to achieve rather than prescribing a way to achieve it. Um, and rights preserving in the in the way that we are trying, as I mentioned, operationalizing values. We keep hearing about AI systems that we want to be fair, interoperable, non-discriminatory, private, safe. Uh, so how to operationalize these values in the technology rather than providing policy or regulations to check for technology to see that those values has been um, uh, inherited in the technology. Um, the AI uh, framework, the way we are developing it, and we think it's important to have uh, a framework that can be used across context and use cases. So the text right now is abstract, high level, uh, but I'll talk about the application of the profile and development of the profile. What we are trying to do is provide the uh, right building blocks and a lexicon for uh, discussions of risk, uh, risks of AI and um, methods and methodologies for measuring those. 
And as I said, it's uh, uh, it's non-regulatory, but beyond that, it's law and regulation agnostic. I'm sure that you guys uh, are more involved in this uh, landscape of the uh, uh, you know, proposals for different way of regulating AI systems across the uh, globe, uh, and uh, some of you might be involved in the discussions of the TTC and all this. Uh, regardless of the policy and regulation landscape, a, a set of specification in terms of uh, clear terminology and taxonomy and metrics for uh, uh, measuring them and uh, uh, guidance and recommendations on the trade-offs that needs to be made on the cost-benefit analysis uh, can help any policy regulatory landscape. And that's what we are trying to do. That's where we're coming by providing the right technical contributions um, um, uh, for uh, use or be discussed uh, by policymaker and regulations when the discussions happens. And it, we are developing in a open, transparent, uh, a collaborative process. Um, and that's true for everything that we do at NIST. So uh, what you see here is uh, the timeline and engagement that we have done uh, uh, from the beginning of the development of the AI RMF. Uh, we started by a request for information in July. Uh, and uh, based on the input that we received, we, had a, the, we put a summary of the uh, input received, had a workshop, Based on the discussion at the workshop and input received, we put the concept paper out for public comment, uh, ran many listening sessions, uh, put another draft for public comment, do a workshop, and you see that cycle continues. Um, we put the second draft out for public comment. It's out for comment until September 29. I would love for you, if you have time, to look at it and let us know your uh, your thoughts. We'll be happy to have another call with the whole team member if you get a chance to look at the AI RMF and get your thoughts and inputs on it. And uh, with that was also called for contributions towards profile that I talk a little bit later and playbook that I will talk about then too. We have another and the third and last workshop planned for October 18 and 19. Uh, all of you are welcome to attend and uh, uh, please register to make sure that you get the right link and all that. And uh, we are on track to put the version uh, 1.0 out by January 2023 as uh, um, mandated by Congress, but the work is not gonna con be con uh, stopped there. It's gonna be continued and I will talk about that too. Very briefly, uh, Later on, I'll talk about some of the uh, trustworthy characteristics. And uh, what I want to try to say is that understanding bias in AI, understanding security of AI, understanding explainability of AI, as you all know, all, each of them are um, um, research topics, um, uh, a lot of attention and uh, 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 good happenings uh, happening in the uh, the whole community from academia to industry. Uh, and uh, we also had built established, uh, built and established research program on explainable AI. A paper was released in September 29 on bias in AI with a paper in uh, uh, March and a revision of the terminology and taxonomy of adversarial machine learning and the infrastructure that we are building for testing that is going to come out. Uh, before end of this calendar year. Um, a little bit again about the AI RMF, just uh, kind of summarizing the things that I said. Um, uh, it, it is all true uh, um, socio-technical uh, approach. So uh, I told you that we have a long tradition of evaluating systems and all of our evaluations were uh, mostly or solely focused on uh, accuracy. So we just would look at the, you know, false positive, false negative, F1 scores and all those. Um, but uh, AI systems are all socio-technical. They are a, uh, a result of complex interactions of the systems, environment, human, and, uh, uh, a, a, and context matters for each of them. One size does not fit all. So in a way, we can still compute false positive, false negative, or F1 score, or any of these things. But uh, even for the question of the accuracy, the question is, what does this really mean in this particular context? But beyond accuracy, it's also important to look at other trustworthy characteristics. Uh, is the system biased? Uh, how the error is gonna be um, uniform across the different demographics or not? Uh, is it privacy preserved or the training data is at the uh, risk of being leaked? Um, uh, and I'll talk about some of those things a little bit. 
So context matters uh, and therefore human-centered design has to be prioritized. Application of scientific methods. So, you know, in software engineering codes get, you know, be tested for uh, verification validations before they are being sent out. Are we doing the same thing with AI systems, for example? So a lot of emphasis on uh, evaluations. Importance of the governance, uh, roles and responsibility, uh, and again, emphasis on a culture of understanding risk and uh, and uh, understanding that uh, there is a shared responsibility for all of the actors across the AI lifecycle for understanding and managing risk. Um, so what does the framework uh, does? Uh, so it talks uh, a lot about uh, really what we are trying to do is maximizing benefits and minimizing risks and trade-offs needs to be made and uh, cost-benefit analysis needs to be done. Um, at NIST, we love to um, start everything from scratch and from terminology and taxonomy. So a lot of discussions about what 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 is risk, what is harm, how quantify harm. Um, and, uh, and so as part of the, you know, uh, background context uh, of the framework, uh, it talks about uh, risk measuring, risk, risk assessments, risk appetite, uh, uh, and uh, uh, measuring quantitative or qualitatively uh, the harm or impact of a, of a system. Uh, a lot of this discussions is not new to AI, it has been happening in the uh, discipline of the risk management and many other uh, risk management for, for example, cybersecurity or privacy. And uh, uh, we made it a sort of a requirement on ourselves that the document is aligned with the work that has been done. So a lot of the terms that you see here are aligned with the international standards coming out of the ISO and other frameworks that has been um, that has been produced. Um, uh, then, uh, so okay, we now we we know what what we mean by risk, and then the next question is what are the AI risks and trying to provide a taxonomy of AI risks or. Uh, we usually use the risk and trustworthy as the two sides of the same coin. I know that this is not a very exact uh, uh, relationship, but uh, just bear with me. Uh, so it, it, again, in, um, from the positive point of view, uh, we are we, uh, with the help of the whole community, with the consultation from the whole community, uh, we are trying to understand, address the question and answer the question of what constitutes trust. And if we want to see, say a system is trustworthy, what type of characteristic and attributes we want that system to exhibit, or why should we should evaluate the system against those uh, to say the system is trustworthy? Um, so it's basically in a way of proofing trust by uh, in a measurable way. Um, there are other documents that talk about this, that what is a trustworthy or principles that they want to see in AI. Uh, OECD AI recommendation I mentioned is one of them. Uh, some of you may follow the EU AI Act that also uh, talk about that. Uh, executive order, um, I know it's a bureaucratic to say the name, but the executive order 13960 that talks about trustworthy AI in government uh, and I'm sure uh, uh, maybe you were involved in some of those discussions. Um, also has a section three that uh, lists the principles of trustworthy AI. Anyway, looking at those documents, looking at what uh, uh, coming out of the uh, ISO uh, subcommittee for D2, uh, what you see on the screen is uh, is uh, the summarization of the discussion. So while the discussion is still going on, mostly in an academic way of what trustworthy AI is, in the AI RMF with the consultation with the whole community, uh, we define trustworthy AI as valid and reliable, safe, fair and biased is managed, secure and resilient, explainable and interpretable, privacy enhanced, and then AI system should be accountable and transparent. Uh, Behind each of them, there is a ton of questions about what do you mean by safe, what do you mean by secure and resilient, again, bringing the whole community on a shared understanding of what we mean by each of them. Even the word bias, that many of us think that we have a good handle of that when we were developing the document on bias in AI, we realized that um, majority of the community uh, uh, use the term bias as a demographic disparity. And uh, in that document, the document, we explained that how bias is more than just demographic dis disparity. Anyway, for each of these uh, boxes, there is a research program at uh, 
for, for some of them at NIST, but uh, in community and in uh, academia, uh, a lot of really work is happening on advancing each of them. So, um, so with that, what's AI risk management? So AI risk management through the four functions that you see on the screen, map, measure, manage, and govern, and try to provide uh, uh, guidance and recommendations on through, through the stage of the map, uh, identify the context and the risk associated with that context. So for example, um, you guys are interested more on a particular you know, communication system. So understanding that context and then from the uh, previous slide on this trustworthy AI, identifying which of these characteristics is most important or are applicable to, to the application. Uh, measure function provides uh, guidance and recommendations for quantitative or qualitative assessment of those risks and uh, a, and also the trade-off bit among them. We all know that, for example, improving uh, privacy and interpretability might be uh, at odds with each other, or uh, you improve the security, maybe you get a hit on the accuracy. Uh, so identifying those trade-offs and what needs to be uh, uh, options that exist, these, these informations can help with uh, uh, managing the risk, which is basically providing a response to the risk identified and, and measured uh, in the previous steps. Uh, we use the word manage and not mitigate because zero risk doesn't exist, such as zero error doesn't exist. Uh, and uh, we provide... Uh, 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 kind of recommendation and guidance on the, uh, what does manage mean, right? Sometimes you just accept risk. Sometimes you just share risk, you know, that's what insurance is. Um, uh, you can change your uh, parameter of the system. You can use another system, or maybe maybe it may identify that the risk is too high that outweigh all of the benefits. So, so the whole AI system needs to be decommissioned. So the, the, the draft talk about this. And all this in a sea of governance, I usually say that everything should start with governance, end with governance. Governance is really setting the right policy, procedures, rules, and responsibility um, for uh, accepting the uh, responsibility of uh, understanding, measuring, and managing risk. Um, uh, what, 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 we, we like to give, as I said, keep the AI framework at a level that's understandable by uh, a very wide range of community. In AI RMF draft, we talk about uh, uh, intended audience, and intended audience goes from the designers, developer, deployers, procurement, and uh, uh, all the way to uh, maybe even general public can be also the audience of this. Um, so we are trying to provide the right level of information to this broad audience in a way that uh, uh, is sector agnostic. Uh, so, uh, so we realized that we need a companion document that gets into uh, more um, the actionable guidance uh, along with uh, informative references of the work that has been done uh, in um, you know, literatures coming out of the academia, uh, codes and tools developed by the community, uh, uh, in um, basically performing the each of the uh, guidance in these different um, uh, functions. So when we released uh, the AI RMF second draft in August 18th for public uh, comment, uh, we put a draft of the playbook out uh, that uh, we implemented uh, the guidance for map and govern. Uh, measure and manage is uh, on the way. We put it out, uh, but we love to hear thoughts and inputs about um, you know, is it the right level of guidance? Are these useful? Um, we know that the presentation can be, uh, and interfaces can be improved a lot. So information on all of that will help us. And then uh, profile. So, uh, and I think that's that's uh, probably my last slide and I uh, uh, start to kick off the discussions. Uh, so, so everything that I said is just trying to say a structured, outcome-based, flexible approach to uh, uh, understand, identify, map, measure, and then finally manage AI risks. And it's important to establish that in a horizontal uh, sector agnostic way. So we have all a shared lexicon on understanding risk because AI risk is, you know, when you talk about, for example, bias or explainability, 
should have the same meaning if you are talking about risk of AI in healthcare system versus communications versus uh, hiring, for example. Nevertheless, as we keep saying, AI is all about uh, context and there is no one size fits all. Uh, we need to build verticals or instantiations of AI or MF for particular use cases. And that's where we had the call for contribution when you actually go and um, a, a apply or implement each of those uh, you know, subcategories between the, among the functions for the particular use case. Um, uh, and of course, the, each use case ha will have its own requirement, will have its own risk tolerance uh, and uh, uh, objectives and purposes. Um, so um, I, I don't know your exact uh, application, but for your exact applications, uh, uh, I'm pretty sure uh, we can have discussions about the uh, development of the use case profiles. Uh, we like to sort of crowdsource source it or uh, ask for contribution towards that because development of these use case profiles really need um, uh, uh, domain expertise. Uh, and we will be more, more than happy to work with the community with you guys if you decide uh, uh, to develop a use case profile uh, for your applications. Um, but also the same entity, the same organizations, the same use case can use the AI RMF uh, for developing temporal profiles. So, uh, you know, do an assessment of the risk today and um, sort of the desired stage that they want to go and use AI RMF guidance and recommendations on how to achieve uh, the, the specific level of AI risk that they need to achieve. I think that's it. That was my talk. I hope it was, uh, it can generate some discussions and questions. With that, I'm gonna stop sharing so I can see you guys and um, yeah, let's start discussions. Uh, Mike, glad to see your hand up. Let's, let's get to the discussion. Yes, um, so that, that was a, a great presentation on the RMF. Um, you mentioned explainability a couple of times. And I, I guess I would just say if ex explainability takes the same path as privacy notices, right, that we receive every day in our outbox and inbox and so on, that kind of approach, um, there's going to be some level of skepticism. So I guess the question is, how do you make explainability more dynamic? Yeah, thank you for that question. And I should have been uh, said something for transparency, which I'm going to put it here. So. So intentionally, before I do that, I also want to give a shout out to Kamran Etemad here. So it's so so great to run to you know old friends uh, in this in this neck of uh, discussion. So uh, we spent a lot of time actually on on packing or uh, distinguishing these concepts of explainability, interpretability, and transparency. Um, in the past year or you know eighteen months or two years, uh, uh, so. Um, here is where we are landing. Um, there are some people equate explainability, or you know, I, I just just not use the terms, and then I tell you what we're using on explaining every parameter, every layer of the neural net, and explaining basically the model. There is value into that, and that is something that the developers and you know uh, may need that and um, most important for debugging the systems or figure out if the system working and if not where it is there is another level of explanation needed and we use the word interpretability for that where you want to explain um, the why so the first one was the how how the model works so if there is, for example, there are laws already on the book that if a loan application is denied, there should be description explanations of what this happened. So if you're using an AI system to, to review the loan applications and uh, accept or, or reject, um, these, these large these models being, you know, people call it black boxes and not knowing why it rejected the loan applications. So you need some explanations from the system that's saying that the loan applications was rejected because of these things. Um, we call that interpretability, and that is to address some of these laws on the book, but also something very useful. And then 
And then we distinguish the concept of the transparency, which is basically documenting every decision and action uh, that happened across the AI lifecycle. And if you had a chance to look at the AI RMF, you would see that in the tables that, that talks about the actions for each of the functions, you would see the word documented many times. So a couple of things here, just by documentation itself, it doesn't make the system explainable or interruptible. It doesn't. Um, it doesn't make the system trustworthy. It doesn't. But it allows um, it, it allows for accountability. It allows for uh, going back and figuring out if, for example, um, the system has been deemed unbiased, how that determination was made, right? What metrics was used, what testing was done, what test data was used, how, uh, you know, what was the threshold to see that it is biased or not? So, so that transparency provide those informations about um, the decision made across the AI system. Um, it probably your next question is that, well, um, will people do this? Will people provide all of these things? I don't know. Again, the AI RMF is all voluntary, and we're hoping that the value that it provides um, make the people to do this. Okay. So, Elam, uh, this is Adam Drobant. Uh, terrific presentation. And um, I remember, I think you gave us one on data a couple of years back. Okay. Uh, so, the first thing is uh, uh, mm -hmm. if you could share the presentation with us. Okay, to uh, if you could send a copy to Michelle and Paul, that would be terrific. Okay, um, and then I have one one sort of basic question. Uh, you know, NIST did a terrific uh, cybersecurity framework, and again, very general, applicable to almost every vertical. The hard part, I would say, was making that framework specific. Okay, to a given industry or to a vertical. Okay. In, in your plans, what are you looking forward to that sort of fills in that next step? Okay. Where let's say this framework could actually be specifically used for telecommunications. Yeah, thank you very much. Great question. And um, by the way, I just put the link to the second draft for you to look at it. And uh, please, uh, if you have time, uh, give us uh, input. We love to hear your thought. A link to the uh, playbook and then the link to the uh, page on ARRMF if you are interested in the workshop. Um, it, 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 thank you very much for the question, Adam. So, um, uh, and your shout out to the CSF. Um, so uh, a lot of things that we are doing here, uh, including the structure of the AI RMF being core functions profile, uh, are all uh, borrowed from the CSF, from the uh, cybersecurity framework, uh, because of the, we use the frame widely successful here at NIST, and it might be a little bit, you know, uh, self-serving, but um, because the community like that, right? And uh, as you said, there was value on uh, a, a structured, flexible, non-prescriptive way uh, and provide a shared lexicon uh, to, to, how, to start the discussions about risk. And uh, as, as we learned from the successes of the CSF that are many, 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 uh, we also uh, uh, you know, were uh, very careful to listening to the comments that's coming. And as you know, uh, CSF is up for revision and we had a workshop about a month ago. Uh, so we are uh, working, uh, actually our team overlaps and working very closely with them. The crowdsourcing of the development of the AI profile is exactly um, uh, inspired by the question that you ask. That if I have a specific use case and I want to go and do that, uh, where do I get more information and how I'm gonna do that? So we did the playbook to give more information and we want to do the profiles with the community. So if you are interested in uh, a profile of AI RMF, uh, 
And to be honest with you, communications is too broad a topic for me, but I'm sure that you have a very sure. particular use case there. Uh, we would we would we'd be more than happy to get into the discussions of what, uh, you know, the specifics of that. I give you an example. Uh, National uh, Fair Housing reached out to us months ago for development of the profile of the AI RMF. And uh, we will be working with them on, on development of the uh, AI RMF. Profile for AI so, profile of AI or MF. Yeah, so so let me maybe ask ask it this way. You know, um, if I look at the past, um, there were a couple of standards that NIST created, uh, and the first one of those was um, uh, I something called IGES. I don't know whether you're familiar with it or not. Okay. Okay. I, and no. that and that ended up being very very successful, and it ended up being what's called the International Graphics Exchange Standard. Okay. 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 And you know the way that proceeded is it started with something very general, got the lexicon down. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what really made it useful in the end is it really went through vertical after vertical to sort of tune itself, okay? Yeah. And this maintained the budgets and the personnel to sort of push that along, okay? Yeah. Okay, next, a little bit more complicated uh, was something called PDAS, okay? Uh, which was called the, the Product Data Exchange Standards, mm -hmm. okay? And that had, uh, again, NIST oversight, it had the lexicon for every vertical, okay? And so when I look at something like AI uh, and I look at PETAs from the past, I somehow think of, hey, PETAs actually has to describe the content, okay, of the products. So anything that's AI that's included in a product or a service is embedded almost automatically in something like PETAS. Yeah. Okay. And so I was just curious, you know, because in, in, in looking towards the future, that sort of uh, uh, creates, I would say, a baseline for capturing the kind of information that then allows you to fill in this framework. Yeah. Okay. And, and I'm just wondering whether anybody has taken a look at something like yeah. that. Okay. Because again, uh, PETAS and then I think STEP that followed it ended up being worldwide standards that everybody else accepted, okay? All of them are excellent points. So, uh, a, 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 and, and several things I need to mention here. Um, you said something about a lot of things that AI, uh, you know, in terms of definitions uh, should, can be found in PETAS. Uh, absolutely right, right? A lot of things, and you also mentioned this uh, CSF. Uh, many of the risks to the AI systems are not different uh, to the risk to information technology systems, right? Uh, exactly. So all of the risk, right, uh, so all of the risk yeah. to the software, uh, um, uh, to uh, privacy, to uh, security uh, exist. Yet AI systems bring some unique risk of their own. And there is a, a appendix in the AI RMF that talk about this. So sure. the scope of the AI RMF is just is just uh, managing the risk unique to AI. And yeah. several times in the uh, functions, we talk about where to plug in other documents for uh, for that. Um, so I, I have a couple of other points. So to make, I, I, I think I'm I'm following what you're saying. So so let me you know this is a, a, an important point, and I think Paul mm -hmm. may chirp in on this. Okay. So what we are seeing is, let's say the EU also has a risk-based framework okay, and some mandates of how uh, risk related to AI and software should be dealt with. Okay. And the thing I find is, yes, there is overall things that are properties in AI that everybody should be familiar with. Okay. But within each vertical, there are bodies that actually have the knowledge and intuition 
of the specific risks. Absolutely. Okay. okay. And having, you know, creating a framework which might lead to a certain amount of what I'm going to call check the box mentality is actually counterproductive. Okay. And Absolutely. having a bureaucracy that does it is even more counterproductive. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the question is, how do you get that framework to be adopted by the bodies in it in each vertical that actually have that intuition and the knowledge base mm -hmm. to do this in a common sense way? Okay. And by the way, not be diluted and in some ways undermined by over centralizing how this is done. Um, uh, Paul has been very patient. Paul, if you give me one minute to, to react and then uh, yeah. uh, uh, several other things that I want to mention. So, Paul, I don't know whether I said that. <laughs> address your no. point uh, very, uh, very directly. We completely understand the verticals. And it's important and uh, exactly right that you need domain expertise to do the vertical. It's going to be, it's not going to be scalable for us NIST to do the, all the verticals right. because of the resources. And we are not going to be able to do that exactly as you said, you need domain expertise for that. That's why we had this call for contribution towards profile that we want to see people from the different sectors, how they're going to do that. And then uh, one thing that I didn't mention here, uh, several things that I didn't mention, quickly say that AI or MF is going to be part of a bigger resource center. So we are also building, you said the terminology. So we are internally, we call it the glossary of the glossary. So we are working with a lot of peoples and even linguistics to help us with all of the concept maps, because as you said, a lot of these terms has already been defined somewhere else, but we want to have one stop shop that we can get that. You mentioned something about international standards. We have been working uh, from the get-go with ISO and IEEE on aligning our work with them and uh, working with a lot of uh, our international partners and also US industry. Once the IRMF is done, um, figure out which part of that and how to contribute either in whole or parts to uh, standardization process. I am a big fan of the international uh, standards, as you all know. Yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, we have to, we have to, you know, there are rules, good, yeah. good laws that international standards has to be developed. Yeah. I, and and I want to just point one other thing before I go to Paul. We, we even have this sentence in the AI RMF that we don't want AI RMF to be a checklist. And uh, and every time we get questions about regulations, in it, in it, in some way, I said that that. When it becomes a checklist, it has lost all of its values. Absolutely. And the last thing that you said about the EU uh, AI Act, I think that's what you were referring to. Yes. Uh, yes, uh, it's, uh, and I'm pretty sure you're following the uh, Trade and Technology Council uh, activities. We just had another uh, uh, call uh, this morning. Uh, you probably had seen there a deliverable as part of the last joint statement that US and EU will work on a joint roadmap for uh, AI risk management yep. and evaluations of trustworthy AI. Um, behind that, what basically it says is that um, it may say that at a high level, US and EU are having risk-based approach, but there are certain differences in our risk-based approach. So the whole idea of that joint roadmap is to uh, understand the differences and see what can be done to bring the two sides together. But I, uh, Paul, I'm, I apologize. I really, really give it to you in 30 seconds. This is what I'm thinking. And this is what I'm pushing in those uh, all of these uh, forums, including TTC. And I think there's some agreement there too. Regardless of the policy and regulation uh, landscape, good technical standards, international standard, is where can bring that uh, 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 harmonizations and alignment to us. If we all uh, define risk in the same way and um, objectives of the risk management the same way, if we all agree that these are characteristics of the trustworthy AI, well, with some variations sure, here. Sure. But but when we are talking about, you know, answering the, the past questions that when you talk about explainability, interpretability, transparency, what you mean by each of them. Even better, if we have a set of uh, interna internationally agreed metrics and methodologies, even better test beds for evaluations that can bring, um, uh, you know, some sort of a 
some sort of a, uh, I, I will say, uh, uh, scientific validation, but also transparency. So, so let me ask, let me ask a question because this is, you know, it's a little off to the side, but it's very relevant. So when when I look at AI, okay, data plays a central role in how effective it is, as much as the algorithms themselves. Yeah. Okay. And one of the, I would say, consequences of, let's say, framework programs like GDPR in the EU, okay, in fact, created a regime where it was much harder to actually expose and share the data across borders. I agree with you. Yes. Okay. Before... And, and frankly, I was in a, call, in a meeting with one of the so... European Before... MPs, and uh, he's also a kind of a... Uh, you know, working on AI space, even he said that the GDPR is a mess and we don't want to make the same yeah, mistake. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And, and so one of the concerns in all of this is when you just look at the risk for AI, how do you align it with the other, I would say, major components like the governance and regimes for data? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is these are all great uh, discussions. We have a sentence there in the AI RMF that says the uh, risk of AI system arise from the data from the systems and interactions with the users. Uh, yeah. All of them are great, and I think there are discussions of the data in the in the uh, functions. Uh, look, I said that we are not going to solve everything by January, right? But the idea sure. is to put something that can can grow, and okay. everything that you say, you need yeah, it's a, lot a learning of curve is, like is anything things, else. Is yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, on on the international uh, international um, alignment. Um, again, it, we we are involved with the TTC discussions, with the Quad discussions, with the Indo-Pacific uh, Economic Forum. And mm -hmm. one of the things, for example, you probably had seen it in uh, one of the uh, uh, secretaries, uh, 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 you know, announcements that, uh, for example, with Singapore, we are going to work on a crosswalk mm -hmm. of AI RMF yeah. with their sure, AI sure. verified. Um, in the AI RMF, there's a table of uh, mapping our trustworthy characteristics, I shouldn't say our AI RMF uh, characteristics yeah. with the other ones. Uh, a lot more work needs to be done. You know, not, none of these things are really easy. And, um, and the, e e even those seven uh, uh, dimensions that you saw, you know, it's, there, there is still a lot of philosophical and academic discussion. Of Sure, All sure. of them are, are wonderful. The last thing I, I would say about the data, I said that there, the, uh, there is a lot of good work has been done that, uh, that, that you know, AI RMF, CSF, data, uh, uh, secure software development framework, all of them we think should be plugged into enterprise risk management, right? They, each of them are looking at the different uh, aspects of the risk. Uh, on the data part, I will just assure you that I'm sure you know uh, there is NSTC subcommittees working on data. We had some congressional mandate working on data. The data discussions, NSF has a lot of discussions on um, uh, data and secure data sharing. Uh, all of them interesting, important um, problems, uh, and we hope to get to all of that. I apologize to Paul. You have been extremely patient. I'm I'll, sorry, I'll Paul. I'll stop talking, Paul. No, that's I stopped okay. talking, Paul. That's okay. No, thank you. It was it was a great talk. It's exactly what I was expecting. And so thank you for that. Um, if I may make a couple of comments and then uh, just a couple of questions that might lead us to some next steps. Perhaps. Um, first of all, I don't think you overspoke on the impact of the, of the cybersecurity risk management framework. I think that's important. We, we have Motorola adopted it as part of our you know, fundamental operation. I think, the, I think the brilliance of that, that you've carried through is that it's a life cycle based approach. It's yep. not a, yep. you know, it's not a product or an organ, you know, an entity based approach. Um, I think you. back on the EU commentary, I was struck by some of your comments when I responded to that on behalf of Motorola, before I knew you of your work, um, my exact response was, it doesn't make sense to regulate AI. It makes sense to regulate AI in the context of what it's being used for. You know, your point of, use the word context so much. Um, that that is where I think um, I think your idea around the profiles becomes so very important. And so my you know my thought would be, and I don't know to what extent you're willing to take this on, but um, you know pushing the idea of what you're doing um, into the EU and some of the regulatory and rulemaking. Um, they talk about a risk management framework, but they don't really offer one to the extent that you guys have thought this through. And they're starting to realize that 
that you can't just regulate AI like water. You have to kind of regulate its use. And so, so you know, I think you've you've offered the only thing I've seen that could actually fit the bill of what they say they want to do uh, without actually doing it. A couple of things that I guess I'm thinking about, I'm I'm certainly interested in taking this a little further and seeing if we can operationalize this or help the FCC potentially look at operationalizing it. What I'm not sure of is, do you have any profiles yet that we could look at just as an example? And if not, no. you know, where I, where I think some of my questions would come in are like, what's the right scope? AI could be applied at the radio level to actually just manage a channel, you know, a particular radio link. Could be applied to management and operation of the entire network, you know, from a nationwide point of view, and almost everything in between. And so, you know, how much do we have to, because these these networks are huge, complicated beasts that will have AI scattered throughout them, mm -hmm. uh, various places. They already so one, do. Yeah, yeah, they already do. Mm -hmm. So one of the tricky parts is not just context, it's scoping it correctly. That's so right. So we don't dilute it too much yeah. and we don't, you know, become too, uh, too specific. You know, some, some of these things are exactly why we decide that the development of the AI or MF should be done by domain expertise and, and put it out for the people to do. Um, uh, or, or the, we don't have, answer your first questions very directly, we don't have any profile yet, and we don't think we should develop any profile because, um, to me, separations of the rules and responsibilities are important. We develop the AI RMF. We want it. For me, development of the AI RMF profile with others is some sort of a test drive of the AI RMF, right? Was there enough? Was it specific enough for the people to actually apply it? So it is just testing my own system, and i rather mm. somebody else test my system. So for that reason... Yeah, for that reason, we want it to be done by others. Uh, in the workshop that's coming, uh, 18 and 19, we have one session dedicated just to profile uh, and, and hear the thoughts. Uh, back to your question about scoping, I think it, that's, uh, uh, you know, when you are doing the AI, AI RMF, there's a lot of questions that the owner of the applications, you know, the owner of the business, whoever is doing it has to answer. Mm -hmm. Risk appetite is one of them. Um, uh, scoping of that is another one. Um, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, it's part of the risk appetite, but uh, the um, the cost benefit analysis. You know, how how much risk we want to get for the benefits that come, and I think these are really uh, not only use case specific, uh, but uh, as you also alluded to, the same use case, the different entities, the different organizations will have different answers to the same thing, right? Uh, I always use this thing that face recognition for law enforcement versus face recognition for unlocking my phone, totally different risk. Face recognition for unlocking my phone versus face recognition for getting into a government building, again, different level of that. So these are all, um, these are all the things that we are really hoping community will be built on this. And we see our job to give a flexible uh, but structured approach that can be useful. So, in any anyway, if if uh, if you guys want to do this and you know submit a any type of profile, um, uh, as an example, uh, would you so be uh, would you be willing to uh, let us think about this a little bit more? I, I understand what you're saying. Um, maybe have another kind of maybe shorter conversation with some more ideas so that you could yep. before we jump all the way into it. Um, yep, absolutely. Um, That'd be good. And then maybe another thing, uh, sounds like we should try to connect to your workshop, which we can do. And by the way, this is a personal thing. You mentioned uh, the FRBT uh, and this is FRBT work. Yeah. Um, I, I'm a big uh, a big follower and fan of that as well. Are you connected with that in any way? Like bringing oh, the I, into Oh, thank that? you. Uh, so, so the first FRBT, if you remember, the report came out 20, 2002. So I was part of the FRBT team then, but when no I way. moved to, so yes. Yeah, so my part, so I was part of that team. Um, and the funny part is that uh, the, the the study of the demographic in 2002 report was basically the work that I did. No, I was part of that team. I still I still uh, uh, miss working with them, but uh, I am. It's funny I'm, though. It's funny, right? That started as not being an AI thing, and now it's virtually. It's very. It is almost all AI based, so you can almost connect what you're working on here with FRBT directly. Because because face recognition becomes the you know poster child of uh, you know deep learning, right? You know it, it sure was, is. It, uh, we have this graphs of showing the accuracy of face recognition across the years of FRBT, and after 2012, there is this big jump because of the uh, CNNs and all this. And now it's well, thank you very much for that. That's great. 
now it's asymptotically approaching, you know, hundred percent accuracy. So it's really interesting. <laughs> That's the, and that made face recognition the topic enough. And it wasn't working. Nobody was worried about it. Now that it's working, everybody's Absol worried about absolutely. it. Absolutely. That's exactly right what happened. Yeah. So, Elam, uh, no, this is this is terrific. I, and I, I have a feeling, you know, by the end of the year, we have to have our recommendations. And uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that's high on our list is how to include the framework as part of that. So, okay. yeah, I, I, I know of your pastime, and I'm sure you have a three o'clock as I do. Um, uh, Paul, by all means, if it helps to have a more specific discussion about this, uh, happy to do that. We, we might follow if, up. And if it becomes something useful to you, uh, great. And if if you decide that it's it's not at the right level at this time, we completely understand. But yeah. happy to continue the discussion. Yeah. Oh, thank you and so I'll bring more of our team member next yeah. time. Too. If if I can ask, is Chuck Ramine still? Uh, Chuck still Ramine is my direct boss, right? So the story. Give, give that, him my regards. I okay. will. I will. Okay. So Adam, uh, I will. Uh, we always laugh about this, but uh, Chuck, uh, you know, when it was FRVT and biometrics, I always say that I was, you know, happily doing that work. Uh, one day, Chuck stops in uh, my office. Uh, at that time, he was my boss's boss's boss and told me that uh, he wants me to come and be his acting chief of staff because his chief of staff <laughs> is going somewhere. And I just paused and say, are you sure? You look at all of the 700 people. He, he needs to be organized, to believe me. <laughs> but that's how I get out of the FRVT. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you. Okay. Definitely. All right. Good talking to you guys. Uh, you. I'll, I'll look okay. forward to we'll, we look action. forward to the presentation. It's all great. Right. Bye-bye. Oh, uh, bye -bye. definitely. I'll send it to you guys. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you, Michelle. You bet. Thank you, everybody, for participating today. We okay. will you, post the uh, edit and post the presentation today to our uh, box so that those that weren't able to be here in person, I heard from lots of people that uh, want very interested and wanted to see it. Yep. So it'll be, it'll be there shortly. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. You bet. Bye-bye.